I believe in heaven. I believe in hell. But I also believe that I've been so bad. And I heard this from somebody just recently. I've been such a bad person and lived such a bad life, made poor decisions, you know, the chronicle of all the things they've done in their lifetime. God couldn't possibly bring me to himself. Really? Then you have completely no idea who God is, and you have completely no idea of why he came to die. He knows that you're a bleep up. He knows I'm a bleep up. What are you, who are you trying to deceive? Who are you trying to fool, and who am I trying to fool? And then comes the reality. Wow, somebody who knows all about me and still thinks I can be in, we'll call it the beloved, I can be part of the family of God. <laughs>
really penal satisfaction on the part of God. And it's important when I start touching on the subject that nobody go too crazy and form too many ideas. There's a lot of opinions out there. Um, somebody asked me actually this last week in a conversation about people who have committed suicide, for example. You know, there's always, as you've heard this before, where people talk about if somebody commits suicide, is it automatically that they're going to hell? And there's a big talk uh, amongst people, especially those who have suffered a loss like that in their life, in their family. Um, the traditional church, and I'm speaking not just of the Roman Catholic frame of reference, but the traditional church in general, jumps to these massive conclusions, basically leaving people here on earth who have suffered that type of a loss with the idea that their loved one is damned forever. I'm here to tell you something different. The Bible clearly says, and I challenge anyone in the sound of my voice to take me up on this, and I will take you up on it. The Bible says all manner of sin will be forgiven. All manner of sin will be forgiven. There's a little, I'm going to put a comma there, even though there may not be one. That's if we are able to talk to God and God, forgive me, right? All manner of sin except for one, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't read anywhere that it says specifically a specific sin except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. We must understand what that means before we jump to conclusions and tell people that their loved ones are already in hell because of our lack of understanding. We only see a portion even the most well-versed person, I don't care how long you've studied the Bible, and maybe somebody like a Dr. Scott who had 50 years of ministry and probably in his 75 years of living probably had 65 of those 70 years tr uh, deeply trenched in the Bible. No one will ever have 100% clarity in your lifetime. Why? Because it filters through the flesh brain even though the spirit's operating and we will always end up with a strange filter that tilts things more towards, towards the flesh understanding than completely towards the spirit's understanding. So with that being said, I wanted to kind of put that out of the way. It really bothers me when I meet people who come up with these, and they are damaging doctrines. No one can know the mind of a person. And I'm going to actually repeat this for the sake of anyone listening to me. And for the sake of a replay, no one can know the mind of an individual who decides to end their life. No one can know whether in the moment before they decided to do what they did, that they didn't cry out to God in mercy and cry out for help and forgiveness. You and I do not have and will never have a right to judge because we, won't, we will not know until we get over there. So make it clear to your friends and people who peddle all of these, and there are doctrines of lunatics who open their mouth and end up condemning and laying guilt on people who are left here, who ultimately will make the trip as well, perhaps in a different way. But the Bible doesn't say and does not explain what I just said in this very clear way. You are nobody's judge, I'm nobody's judge, and let's not be so quick to say a person's going to hell. In fact. Jesus teaches more about this in the opening of Matthew's gospel in the sense that if, we, if we're going to read this properly, we're going to find out that Jesus has a lot to say about this Gehenna, and he's got a lot to say about Hades, and he's got a lot to say about everlasting punishment and fire and also life eternal. So that's why I said we need to handle these in such a way um, that we don't end up, for example, in a inspired, I'm sure, moment like Jonathan Edwards, the preaching of Jonathan Edwards, sinners at the hands of an angry God. No, God, I don't think, is looking on the creation and saying, I must annihilate everyone. In fact, that's another doctrine that I must teach on, which a lot of people like to talk about, but it is not scriptural, which is annihilationism. Essentially, that God will basically take the sinner and incinerate and essentially destroy and you're wiped out. Well, if that was the case, that would be too easy. Think about that. If God is just in the business of annihilating people when you die, and that's, and that's what hell is, then 
go ahead and live like hell because the punishment will be really quick. If you're just annihilated, then it's no big deal. But if you're going to talk about heaven as eternal and without time, then you also have to talk about hell as eternal and without time. And if heaven is it being in the presence of God and with God, then hell must be the pain of separation and the knowledge, not just the pain of separation per se, but the knowledge of what you are missing by not having God there. But don't be deceived. This is the other mistake people make. They want to make it so that God is all about heaven and in heaven and around heaven, and the devil controls, controls hell. That's not true. Anybody who thinks that has it all wrong. Hell is a created place, a real existing place designed by God. It's not God's pleasure to punish, but the scripture says some were created to honor and some to dishonor. Some were created for, to be built up and others for destruction. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So please don't come with me uh, with this mindset of universalism that all will be saved. I've already covered this. And quite frankly, if you would like to twist the scriptures, and there are many who do this who will say, well, the punishment is only for a time. Well, with God, it's like this. He gives us, in our lifetime, he gives us abundant chances and abundant opportunities. And sometimes I think we don't really realize the opportunities that he gives us over and over, not just to start over, sorry, God, get up, start over again, and repeat but he gives us the chance to get to know him better, to, to better understand his purpose, his intent, his will. And rejection of that is just as bad, as I said last week, as rebellion. Rejection of somebody throwing you a lifeline. You're drowning. Just pretend you're drowning. <laughs> throw you a lifeline, you tell me you don't want it. I'm going to probably keep trying to throw it a couple of times, but then if I realize you're not going to take it, Quite frankly, if, I, if there's no way for me to actually get over there and save you, you're going to die. Don't blame me. That's what people like to do to God. He throws out many lifelines to us over the course of our life. We fail to recognize. That's our problem. So we'll start with this word base that I'm doing right here, and we're going to see if we can't expand a little bit. But I'm going to try and stay in a narrow passage today of concepts that we can then elaborate on a little bit as we go. So if you would, please open your Bible. So I'd like to show you some concepts that I'm talking about. Matthew 5 is the place we're going to start. I want you to look at a few words in Matthew 5. And I circle words all the time. I tell you, circle stuff in your Bible. That's the only way you might be able to go back or if you're taking notes. But I want you to circle three words in three different verses. So Matthew 5.22, and I'll read the passages in a minute, but you're going to circle the word hell there. Matthew 5.29, you're going to circle the word hell there. And Matthew 5.30. These, these all occur as the last or second to last words in these three verses. Now, the word that is occurring there, if you have a Bible like mine, it will say the Strong's number is 1067. And I will write this, um, see if I can write it in the best English way possible. We'll write Gehenna like that. That's understandable. Remember I said this word is associated with a place of perpetual burning, with a place of perpetual punishment. The, 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 the smoke or the smoldering that never goes out, okay? So, um, you almost, it's almost hard to jump in here like this because I was talking about last week from the Beatitudes, and Jesus moves into this interesting passage repeatedly where he says, you've heard it said unto you, but behold, I say. And once you get into this, you see that basically Jesus is taking concepts that these individuals in his immediate listening audience would have known and understood based on the fact that he's taking from the Old Testament. Behold, you've heard it say unto you, but I say. And a whole, it's a whole series of teachings that occurs here. 
So beginning at verse 21, um, it's really, this kind of begins to explain a little bit about our relating to one another. You've heard it, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, and he's quoting the scripture, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Let me stop right here. Because no, no scholar likes to go down this pathway. Everybody would like to have a little out here. Even the best theologians who have tackled this passage would like to say some qualification on would being angry with a brother without cause. But be very careful because a lot of people have tried to make this into something that could be less precise, and in fact, it's very clear. Jesus made this very clear. He said, thou shalt not kill, but he says, behold, I've said to you, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as, he puts in the same plane, hating as murdering. So when he says here, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, which begs the question then, somebody say, who is my brother, and what would it be to be angry with my brother without a cause? Like, does he have to have a deliberate act against me and there, therefore I'd be justified in being angry? Don't, don't start doing that, what I call the legalistic, and it is, it's legalistic BS that people engage in to get around the scriptures because they don't really want to deal with what's said there. That's the bottom line. And if I'm being direct and it's offensive, I mean it. I mean to offend that way because I'm tired of people saying, well, it doesn't really mean that. It means what it says. Period. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka. Now, if you look in your mar margin, if you have something like my Bible, my Bible says vain fellow or empty, or I should have brought my m multiple uh, modern translations because one of them says, you fool, you idiot, you moron. Shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So that hellfire right there is the word Gehenna. And at least there we have hellfire, which we know we can make the connection. That does not, I, I'm trying to make a distinction now, so I'm going to drive these three words home before I show you something that we need to know between Gehenna and Hades. So hold that thought for a second. Let me go back now and keep reading it. And I might as well just read through the passage because it's going to be so choppy otherwise. You'll be like, what happened? So let's just, we've got time, let's do this. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave thy, gift, leave thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So we can see very plainly in Jesus' teaching and I've said this before, a sideways relationship to your fellow man, and he uses the word brother, and we'll talk about that, but that sideways relationship is important in his, in his eyes. We tend to spend a lot of time worrying about what's here, this, what's here, this, but we don't spend a lot of time contemplating what Jesus said about our relationship sideways. I can't tell you, hey, go be nice to somebody because that's not natural to you. But I've said many times, a yielded vessel, yielded to the Holy Spirit, you may not be one of those people I stay away from, the backslapping type of Christian, but you will look on your fellow man a little bit differently, even the ones who are the most egregious the ones who persecute you, the ones who are offensive, you're going to look on them differently. You'll find yourself saying things about them like, what a shame that that person is. Finish the sentence, I don't care, but it will be more with pity than with hatred. It'll be more, this is what the Spirit does. It'll be more like that person has no clue. I know what the Scripture says. Be careful about who you come in contact with. You don't know that the person that you're talking to, you could be, as the scripture says, entertaining angels. And was the last time during this last week that you thought you met somebody and you might be entertaining angels versus somebody you thought just may just be a, 
a real uh, bona fide gift. <laughs> you never know. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, the judge deliver, deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast in the prison. And prison here is being used synonymously with Gehenna. Here is where people like to twist this and make it something it's not. Now remember, Jesus spoke many times using parabolic methods. Sometimes he used other methods to convey, and here's one of them. He says, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utter, uttermost farthing. Now, people have taken that to mean because it is in reference to Gehenna. Remember, the place of punishment and burning. That if one can repay, one can be let out. And we know unequivocally from Luke's writing that that's not the way it works. You cannot cross over. Once you're there, you're there. There is no crossing in between whether, I don't care of what, what denomination you want to be affiliated with, it is a chasm that cannot be crossed. And once you get that in your head, it, it may change the way you want to live your life. I don't know. Certainly for me, I'm looking at this through the lenses of whoever would like to interpret this. There is an interpretation, I believe, but it will be not to be released from the place of punishment. And I may actually elaborate on this perhaps on festival, but I don't want to lose track of what I'm doing here. So let me keep going. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But behold, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. A lot of people don't like to hear about the sayings of Jesus, but here we go. Don't, you know, you talk to people and they say, oh, well, this is what sin is. But Jesus says he's taking, he's taking the law and he's kind of actually raising the bar. He's not lowering it. Some people say, oh, the law can't be lived. Well, whatever Jesus did, he lifted it up so high that the only way to obtain where he is is to be in him and he in you. Otherwise, forget about trying to obtain. That's not obtainable on your own, and in the flesh it's not possible. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Please don't. <laughs> to my uh, friend who is a chaplain who told me the dreadful story about a person who had definitely a mental illness and didn't understand and thought that was the way to get deliverance. This is a saying of Jesus. Essentially, what is offensive to your faith and operating in the faith, remove it. Sometimes we meet people who are not friendly towards our faith or towards our beliefs. They'll talk to you about anything else except what you believe in. And I believe that if you encounter people, they have a right to their opinion, but if they try to put their opinion on me, to try and make it some offense against what I believe, my attitude is, bye. That's an offense to me. And anything else that comes in the way, because this, what is being said here is pretty clear. If, you're, if your right hand offends thee, I mean, I'm just kind of jumping over this, but let me go back. Right eye first. Right eye offends thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not the whole body should be cast into hell. There's our word again, uh, Strong's 1067, Gehenna. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee, for it's profitable if one of thy members should perish, not that the whole body should be cast into hell. There it is again. So essentially there should be a thought process, and I can't do this for you. This is one you're going to have to meditate on and think about. I can't do it for you because each person will be, it'll be different for them, each person unique to them, to, to meditate on what exactly that might mean. The right hand is always used as the place of power. That could be, money can be a stumbling block. It could be anything that is offensive, that collides with your faith or interferes with it. You remove it. Don't think it's going to get better. It's like these, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say this in passing. It's like the folks out there that come to me and they say, I want to get married, and they want to meet or get married with someone who does not have the same spiritual or religious values. 
that is a train wreck waiting to happen because it may not be top, front, and center at the beginning, but it will become something that will become a reality of hindrance in your growth and development through the scriptures with God. I always say try and, try and find someone either that has an open heart, an open mind, but don't get involved with someone, quite frankly, who is closed off. God can always open their heart, but the difficulty is that they will essentially force you at some point to decide between your faith, following your faith, and being as a flesh vessel, being with that individual. I'm just, that, and that I just gave you my opinion, but I could back it up with Bible. I'm just saying, simply put, Jesus is very clear. These three words in their occurrence, in verse 22, in verse 29, and in verse 30, are all represented by this Greek word, Gehenna. Now, if we were going to look at the words for, uh, we're referencing the words Hades, I would, I'm going to go to a passage which actually becomes my text for today. So I want us to go to Matthew 16. It's a familiar passage for you. That is uh, Peter's declaration to Christ right there at uh, Caesarea Philippi. Matthew 16. And then what happens in, let me read what Peter says. The declaration in verse 16, thou art the Christ. Because Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, which is not being determined or to be understood as Peter as the rock. Can we ever get over that one, friends? Because it's so irritating that someone would actually interpret that Peter would be the rock when he's just a person, like you and like me, special, but just a man. But he says also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I want you to take a look at something. The word there in, this up here was in Matthew 5 and onward. This one here is in Matthew 16 and verse 18. And that word there, if you see you've got a Strong's number for 86, is the word for Hades. Now, this is why I wanted to start working on these words today and planting some, we'll call them seeds. The difference between Gehenna, as you can see, shall be in danger of hellfire, which is directly attached to a judicial sense of punishment, satisfaction for rejection, disobedience, whatever you, however you want to phrase that, versus what is said here. Uh, when he says, my church, I will build my church and the gates of hell of Hades. The unseen, let's call this associated Gehenna with punishment, and this is simply the unseen world. Now, why is that important? It's really important when you get to the book of Revelation. See, the unseen world cannot continue forever. Remember, I said to you, if there is and there will be a destruction of this earth, in fact, I have to share something really funny. Somebody was asking me about this, and I started talking, and I got on a little bit of a diatribe explaining about heaven and hell and about how the earth will be recreated. And so, I don't know, suddenly somebody just managed to sit down who wasn't part of this group and sat, started listening. <laughs> I kind of started to feel bad for that individual because I was talking a lot about hell, and they had no idea what, what they just walked in on the conversation. But uh, <laughs> strange things happen in my universe. My point is it's going to matter a lot when you get to the book of Revelation to understand the difference between the two. Why? Because at the end, when you get to the end of time, it says that this word for hell, Hades, death and Hades 
will be thrown into the lake of fire. The unseen world will cease to exist at some point. And this is very important. When Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me dig a little bit more on this. The gates of the unseen world. And the unseen world can constitute good and bad. But in this case, I'm very assured that the unseen forces may actually constitute more of what would be opposed to Jesus building. That We'll call it on the negative connotation side of unseen forces. And why is this important? Because Gehenna will be a place, we'll see the word and we'll follow it through scripture, ultimately referring to something in Revelation, which is a place of, when we say, finality in terms of punishment versus the unseen world, which does not speak immediately of punishment, simply a place of the unseen realm. And people say, well, where do the dead go? And we all ask, the, come on, we all ask these questions. Where are the dead people? And don't say they're here. <laughs> you know, people say that. Where are the dead people? You know, we know, look, there, there's, a, there's a cemetery across the street. And you know if you've gone through the exercise of seeing a loved one off, you buy a casket, there's procedures they do if the body's intact and the body's placed in the ground and eventually the body does decompose and what's left may be some bones and trace. Long enough, there'll be very little left, a little DNA left in the box and that's about it. All right? So you've got the natural thing that happens with death and we know that the Bible says for sin comes death. No one escapes it. There is no escaping that. But where do the dead go? And I've talked about this. The soul deposit, the arabone deposit of God placed inside the believer that essentially takes the soulish part of the person with him, he is a person, the person of the Holy Spirit deposit in us, to be with the Lord. That also belongs to the realm of the unseen. And I know a lot of this kind of sounds like, ooh, but you have to think about this. If we will receive a new body, if we will receive a new essence, not we will be ourselves, but we will receive a new covering, the essential person has to be somewhere. So we say that the best understanding right now, because as I progress, you'll see it, there's layers to this, but the best understanding is the unseen world and the realm of what I've called even a parallel universe. Somebody once asked me, do you believe that the dead people can see what goes on here? For many years, without sound biblical doctrine, because it was something that was basically kind of passed on to me, I used to believe, no, they can't see. Because if they could see, they would be filled with grief to see what's happening here. If somebody loves you and they're departed and they see you suffering, wouldn't they have the sense of suffering too? Here's the thing, though. They're not in heaven yet. They're not in their finalized, as I refer to it, a finalized state. If there is a place, a place of the unseen, then just what the book of Hebrews talks about, this cloud of witnesses, where, whether they be an angelic cloud of witnesses, but there is a cloud of witnesses about us. Somebody just went, oh, crap. <laughs> So it's important for us, <laughs> leave it to me, it's important for us, though, to distinguish between these two things. But then there's something else on top of this. So I, I'm starting to separate these words as I'm showing, and we'll, we'll touch on Tartarus in a separate conversation because I feel that it's worth it to kind of dig in that area and see why Peter used this. But I want you to kind of think with me for a second of how brilliant... You know, how God laid all this out is kind of mind-boggling. He gives us these, we'll call them vignettes, that happened. For example, the warning that was given, and I'm using this as an example to make my point about Gehenna. He gave a warning to Sodom and Gomorrah. And essentially, if you remember, there was a plea, if I find a righteous one here, even right down to one righteous one, to not destroy but God could not find and made good on his promise to essentially rain down fire and brimstone and wipe out the place that we refer to as Sodom and Gomorrah. When God says, 
I'm done. It, he'll, as you see, when you read that passage, he gave several opportunities for the people to repent, but it wasn't there. It didn't happen. In that case, God just completely did away. We'd call that annihilation. There was nothing left. We'd say the same thing with Noah and the ark. God saw the evil that was upon the land, sent the waters, and only those who were obedient, that was found in Noah and his family, to build the ark, get inside the ark, and start over again, judgment upon the earth. So I don't know why we get into the mindset of thinking that God couldn't possibly, when we read this word back in Matthew 5.22, could he not possibly kick this into gear as punishment? And, and it's not punishment necessarily for what we'd say bad behavior. It's punishment for simply saying, I choose not to. You have a choice. You have free will. You're not, none of us here are in this wound up position where you must accept and you must do and you will be. You've got a choice. And that choice, by the way, is what got us here in the first place with Adam and Eve. So when we take this, pick these words apart, I begin to see something else here. Jesus sees his church, and I, I know I've taught on this passage a lot, but Jesus sees his church as something of a force. Too bad that, I'm just going to say it, the people in the sound of my voice, I believe you take it seriously, but too bad more people don't take it seriously and treat the church as if it's something of the entertainment venue and not something of a fighting force. Because when he says, I will, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my outcalled ones, Jesus is essentially saying, I'm going to do what I set out to do, and these unseen forces, oh, they may try but they will not prevail against, they will not overtake, they will not have victory. In fact, I wrote it out in several different languages because I was kind of gripped by something. When will we come to a real understanding that we are at risk because we become so complacent, and I've said so impotent in our beliefs, in what we really know deep down? If you have nothing that you absolutely unequivocally have, this is in my heart. These words live in me. If it's not there, how can you fight against what you don't think is in opposition to you? And this is what's happened to the modern church. The gates of the unseen realm, and I'd like to also put it, another little commentary in there about the gates, per se. The gates are not necessarily what you think them to be as simply a place of opening. I was reading this Greek word. Let me find my notes here to say it's very simple, that likened to, could be likened to a door, a large door, but also likened to what is either being restrained or what is bursting out onto the other side as an exit. Don't just think of it as merely a door, but the forces that may be pushing or pulling on to either gain entrance to or out of. And when you put that in perspective, you realize there are unseen forces perpetually against the church, and the church has, doesn't have one iota that it's under attack constantly because we choose this idea of the church as something that's fun, entertaining, all the things you've heard me rail against for 15 years now. And I'll simply say this to you, if we would take this more seriously, you know, uh, Jesus goes on to tell Peter, and I'll give unto thee the king, keys of the kingdom of heaven. Well, he's given the keys of the kingdom to every single believer, not just Peter, as some would like to tell you, but he's given the keys. He, he, in Revelation, says he possesses the keys too. But he's given each one of us when we exercise faith and trust him. Then opens the door of the people that say, well, how can I know about Jesus? Is it really true? Is he, is he who he said he was? Is he really? And I don't want to go there just now. I'm going to save that for... Easter, which I will bring on sooner than later because it ties, it must be tied into this. You can't have one without the other, sorry. But what I do want to carry through this is recognizing when we read the word hell, it's not all the same. We're dealing with different words and they are giving us insight. Now remember a couple of weeks ago I taught on the banquet about the one that snuck into the banquet and didn't have the right garment and they carried him out into utter darkness. 
and you, need, you now need to start bringing those concepts into this concept of Gehenna. They will tie in. The wrath of God ties in. There are other words, like some we've taught on, I think, really uh, a lot more than others. For example, the passage out of 1 Corinthians 1.18, uh, the word of God to those that are in the process of perishing, right, is utter foolishness. So all of these concepts will bring together, but having the ability to discern and to know the words apart begin to help us understand what we cannot see here and now. The place of punishment, and it'll become more and more clear. The later chapters of Matthew and some other passages through the Gospels, when we get to Paul, and most specifically and with clarity in Revelation, to understand God is not playing a game here. He's not saying, I'm going to threaten you so you can be scared straight, and then at the end you get a little candy bar reward because you were actually a little good boy or a good girl. That's not what he's saying. The warning has been going out from the beginning. This is the other thing that I think I can't say enough. That phrase, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Even today while I speak, and although I speak just as a person, I have no power, I'm nobody, I'm just the same as you, sinning flesh. But even today as I speak, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, carries with it the concept, the kingdom of heaven being from the time of John the Baptist to the time of Jesus' declaration being heralded even today. People choose to do otherwise. I have discussions with people about this, and they, they have their own take on what it means, eternal destiny. Now, I don't want to scare people. My goal in this series, because I am now starting to try and talk about hell a little bit more, uh, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm not trying to make you fearful. God is not the author of fear. There'll be people that'll say, but you don't know, I, I haven't lived a good life, and even though I'm a Christian, I haven't been a good Christian, and I haven't been as good as I, you know, you start down that pathway, it's like a, it's like a hamster. You, know, you just keep going round, 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 round. Rather, I frustrate not the grace of God. I know what I am. I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm going to speak for me. I would like every person to pretend for a minute you can, in your mind, think it for you. I know I haven't been a good person and lived a good life. When I say that, I look back at before I knew the Lord and all of my thoughts about what I thought it was to be a good person or a Christian completely flushed down the toilet when I encountered Christ in this book. There is none that do good, no, not one. I don't care what your best is, it's always going to fall short. And if what I just said, what Paul wrote in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, then by one man's disobedience, as Romans 5 declares, by one man's disobedience, death came upon all the earth, and by one man's obedience, that last Adam, we may have that restoration, reconciliation, and life eternal. Now, let's talk about this for a second, because there's going to be people out there, and I've heard this, and it drives me crazy. Christian people, not somebody else, Christian people, I believe in heaven, I believe in hell, but I also believe that I've been so bad, and I heard this from somebody just recently, I've been such a bad person and lived such a bad life, made poor decisions, you know, the chronicle of all the things they've done in their lifetime, God couldn't possibly bring me to himself. Really? Then you have completely no idea of who God is, and you have completely no idea of why he came to die. He knows that you're a bleep up. He knows I'm a bleep up. What are you, who are you trying to deceive? Who are you trying to fool and who am I trying to fool? And then comes the reality. Wow, somebody who knows all about me and still thinks I can be in, we'll call it the beloved, I can be part of the family of God. That's where the knowledge of all of this heaven and hell becomes important. You're going to stop focusing on listening to the voice of the devil who will tell you, Maybe for somebody else, but not for you. Or maybe you've been so bad, even as a Christian, your faith has been sloppy, your Bible reading, whatever. God is not asking you for perfection. He's asking you to trust him. When the questions come, somebody asked me just recently, can you prove to me? What can you tell me to prove that Jesus actually lived and he actually came out of the grave? Because if you can prove that to me, I'll believe. Okay, you got time? 
because it's not going to it's not going to be five minutes. It's not even going to be an hour. I would like to tell every single person in this room who's heard about solid facts about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the information you're armed with, most people do not have. All of the years, 30 years of Dr. Scott's ministry and 15 years of mine, I can tell you 45 years combined with whatever else you've read and whatever else you've done, take that information and carry it with you. You will encounter people who do not know where to even start looking for the proof. Share it with them. Then it's up to them to make the decision. You're not there to try and force them. You can't force someone. But you can share what you know, and you can put the information like I do. And I say to you, I say to the people out there, you know, it hurts me. I don't want people to believe me. Believe nothing I say, but believe the Word of God and believe 100% the Word of God. And start, if you're that skeptical, and I was like that, start by setting out to disprove. Start there. I know that's crazy, but all the people who came to the faith that were absolutely positive, there is no God, and this is all made up, started off on a quest to disprove. And where they wound up, I'm going to say with all the history and evidence that I know of all of these great converts, these were people who set the course to say, not so that ended up saying there can be no other conclusion. Brilliant minds, not, not men of uh, little standard or little understanding, but brilliant minds who were absolutely, unequivocally, there is no God. C.S. Lewis is one of them. And I can go down the list of the many who then became great defenders and contributors to the faith. So I can't make you do it, but I can say, Start with this, and these words I'm laying down today will begin something to get clarity. Too many times I hear people talk about things regarding hell. Oh, you do that, you're going straight to hell. Find that in the Bible. I think there is an act, just as I quoted about all manner of sin shall be forgiven except that which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Let me touch on that for a minute because there might be somebody here today that says, well, what, tell me what that means then. What does that mean for me? It means that God came right here and something that was absolutely, you knew something was going on. He chose to just kind of push it away. It's like ignoring a still small voice, ignoring a little tap on the shoulder. That wasn't just a one-time thing. It was that nudging that you knew at some point couldn't be from your friend, your wife, your brother, your sister, mother, or father. It had to be coming from somewhere else. Failure to acknowledge God's care for you, his presence in your life, and his will for your life. And don't think it's just black and white. It's those people that say, and I heard somebody say this just the other day, I believe in God, but here comes the next part. I believe in God, but. Until you get rid of your but, <laughs> God is still going to be saying, I'm not listening. How would you like it? And again, I keep going back to this because the only thing I know to do how would you like it? I'm looking at you. You're my good victim, Kevin. How would you like it if I said, well, you tell me a story about what you, you know, your, your expertise, and I, I don't believe it. Everything you tell me, that's your expertise. This is what you've spent your whole life doing. I say, I don't believe it. I don't believe anything you tell me. At some point, you're going to say, you know what? I'm not talking to her anymore because she doesn't want to listen to me, and I have all the expertise, and she's just a silly person. But I'd say that to you if God was speaking to your heart. You knew it. But you decide, ah, that's for like weak, lame people. Only, only people who are really messed up in the brain could listen to that, right? Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's kind of pissing away your day of grace. And you might not like the way I said it, but it's just the way that is. Now, some people have abundant opportunities that come, and they keep coming. And then one day they stop. And when they stop, It'll be imperceptible. You won't even notice it. That's if you were ever interested or ever cared. But imagine a whole host of people that when you talk to them about this place of burning and perpetual punishment, 
They still think it's a caricature. They still think, how could a good and loving God condemn or punish? And I'm going to tell you something. Anybody who thinks that God wouldn't hasn't read the Bible and hasn't seen what God did to his own chosen people when he said, you are my chosen people, gave them a plan, gave them a pathway, gave them the power, led them out of Egypt's bondage. He showed himself to them. You know, in our day and age, because oh, if I could only see, but he showed himself to them. Oh, then there'll be those people that say, well, did that really happen? Come on, stop turning in circles here and get, get on the page with me. And my point is, at some point, God says, I've had enough. How many people came, how many people went into Egypt's bondage? How many people came out and they came out richer and stronger and greater than when they went in as a people coming out? But how many people made it into the promised land? There is the question that if you can actually answer that from Scripture, which is just maybe, what, one, two, three, it's a handful. It's not many. Because God finally had enough. Well, that's the God of the Old Testament. No, God's always been who he was, and he's only looking for one thing. I know it's hard to do this for most people. I'm not telling you to be a blind automaton and just follow somebody blindly. I'm not even telling you to follow me blindly. I'm telling you, you get into the Word and you start picking apart these words, and you begin to realize that the subtleties are going to matter. I'm not going to stay in the realm of unseen forever, and neither are you. And there will be a time where there will be a judgment for all people at the great white throne, that place of judgment. Prior to that, it says the righteous dead and those lost and saved will be raised up, and those who are lost, those will stand and give an account there before they are sent off to wherever they're going. And I'm not saying those and these, and I thank my God, I'm not, no, I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying there will come a time. And failure to recognize that is as critical failure to recognize that God actually says there will be punishment. The punishment's already started. The wages of sin is death. That's why nobody is here right now in our current state forever. It almost seems like it's so self-evident. You'd think that everybody would say, well, of course, because if it wasn't, we'd be here forever and ever and ever unless you believe that we're some, we are a product of some other making other than God. And sorry if you go down that pathway, you've already lost me because I'm not interested in uh, saying that I came from a single cell, amoeba cell, or from an ape. If you want to do that, that's your business. Uh, I would like to think that I'm slightly more civilized than an amoeba cell or an ape, and I'd like to think that of you too. And I'd like to think that God's very smart in his design. He didn't just make an accident and then start like, oh, let's, let's modify this and let's see if that creature can walk up right now. I don't think it works that way, sorry. <laughs> so having said all that, if there are no accidents, I can pretty much take license to reach back in the book and start talking about, as I said, don't just talk about heaven and say, oh, this is the wonderful destiny, and, but you need to talk about the other things too, the unseen, where Jesus said, in his own words, I will build my church and the forces of this unseen realm will not prevail against my church, which tells you that there will be a constant attack and buffering on the church, which I think there has been. If you look at history, including up until this day and age, and the attack may be just a little bit different with people turning their backs away because from the inside, the church has destroyed itself, not from the outside, from the inside. We have uh, decided that this Bible is too old, too archaic, not social enough for people, not with enough causes and enough uh, emotive motivation to get you behind to follow Jesus. I'm sure when Jesus said, follow me, he didn't say, follow me as I go feed the poor. He didn't say, follow me as I perform many miracles. He just said, follow me. I wish I could say what I want to say, but I can't. <laughs> Because, man, if I said it, you know, I really think Jesus said it that way. I don't, he, I don't think he said, please. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's where my mind goes. But I want to make sure we leave here today with this distinction clear, because as I start getting into the passages that talk about this, I'm also going to be attaching concepts attached to Gehenna, that place of punishment, 
And it's required, as I said, to lay this out this way because there are other words that will tie into it. Specifically, as I mentioned at the top of the message, the wrath of God. And when you get into understanding the wrath of God, the wrath of God is not a new concept. The wrath of God goes straight through the book. And we, we can actually begin to get a mindset into the mind of God in understanding what is it when people say, well, what, what is it that drives the wrath of God? We're going to look at that because if you're like me, I'm going to be wanting to know am I, in my life, I would not want to be provoking God. I'm not saying that I don't provoke God. We could be doing things, saying things. I don't know. I just look at the book and I think to myself, it's important for us to dig in there and understand more about the mind of God that will at least tell us God has made a way for us. And he's made a way that's so plain if we'll just pay attention. Pretty simple. And to not think, by the way, that each time you read the word hell, that it spells out the same thing. That is the trouble with these uh, all English versions, is it's very hard to know what word is actually being used. So here we have two concepts. We'll deal with the third one, and at least the start of something, that we have some terminology to be able to start picking apart the subject and being able to draw links together from these words to build up a right and proper understanding. When people say, someone's going to hell, and the next time you hear somebody really seriously saying that, we might better understand and watch what we're saying because the reality is that the things that we perceive, we perceive are hell worthy. God looks at it and probably says, no. And in fact, the things that we would think would be so great and acceptable, he's probably looking at it and saying, yes. Substituting faith in him for works is, is, it, it's not that it's evil in and of itself, but it's saying that what he did wasn't enough, even to that degree, would be worthy of saying, why would a person deserve heaven when Jesus came to pay the ultimate price and give his life, and you're saying it's not enough, you've got to do more? So we'll, we'll kind of pick this apart, but at least we have a place to start, and something for you in your own time that if you're interested in doing a little bit of homework, if you have a Strong's, or if you have a Bible like mine, at the back, you've got those Strong's numbers. Look up the references, look up synonyms, but specifically look up the references where these occur and try to see and distinguish between what is unseen that is not necessarily representing punishment of any kind immediately versus that which is represented by the words hell or hellfire that's very suggestive of punishment or satisfaction on God's part to understand that there will be a place for the unseen realm until God says the unseen is over. And when in that recreated period that becomes new heaven and new earth, there'll be no need for an unseen world because everything that was hidden will be made clear and be revealed in front of us. There won't be a need for something unseen. It will be all put into the light because he is the light. So we're going to keep going. I hope I have brought a little bit more clarity. We're going to keep forging forward on this until we can go. We know exactly, at least on this subject, what we're talking about right now. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.